Hello again, this is Derek, and today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about open source software, why you should care about it, and how you can contribute to it. So, first question is obviously, who am I, why should you care what I have to say, and why should you listen to me? I'm a senior video engineer at Vimeo. Um, I work on media stuff, transcoding, ingest, images, that kind of thing. Um, but the main points I want you to take away from that is we we do not fork things internally. We upstream all our patches and contribute back, and we invest in open source, uh, such as Ravi, uh, Rust AV1 encoder uh, run by Mozilla. Um, and we have contributed fairly heavily to that in recent times. Um, I'm a VideoLAN nonprofit board member, and what that means is I get to make very, very boring votes um, about finances and things like that about uh, how VLC uses its uh, donations. I've been contributing to open source software since 2003. Yes, I was 13 when I started, I'm a, I was a youngin, and I started by working on XChat, um, which uh, some of the uh, people similar to my age here may remember is an IRC client. And my first patches were actually uh, documentation, like documenting things that just weren't documented. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, coming up. Um, I was an active FFmpeg community member for many, many years. Um, I still submit in patches. I'm just not quite as active uh, anymore, but I do have quite a few patches in uh, mainline over the years. Um, and I have all I have all sorts of contributions to open source stuff like Raviel, Smash, FFv1, X264, etc. Uh, a bunch of Go packages, a bunch of corporate stuff that we've open source and my own personal projects like uh, BXD, which is a uh, hex diff tool and DTV source, which is a DVD indexing tool. But really, I'm just some guy who thinks open source software is the bomb and that everyone should work on it. So what is this talk and what can you get out of it? Um, I want to talk a little bit about what open source software is and why you should care about it and how you can get uh, started contributing and maybe a little help for once you've started contributing and you maybe run into some problematic interactions with the community, um, ways you can contribute to the community, and uh, some general tips and rules uh, for contributing. Um, but keep in mind that ultimately these rules aren't the word of law. It's up to the project that you're contributing to or that you're running uh, to set its own rules. But uh, in general, common sense does apply. And as, as stated in the last slide, I'm not an authority. I'm just someone who really wants to see more people contributing to open source and thinks it's a great idea. So before I explain or try and convince you that you should care about uh, open source, I want to pose you a, uh, well, the reverse question. Uh, what, and I'm going to say legitimate here, what reason other than like makes management happy can you think to prefer proprietary software uh, I'm going to say specifically for our archival and media pipelines, what reason is there for you to prefer that over open source software? I'm going to guess uh, probably exactly two reasons came up, which is support or, or an SLA and because media industry specs are really nasty and complex and this one special piece of software is probably the only one that handles my specific variant of it really, really well. And I'll try and address these questions in this slide and the upcoming slides. So I'd like to pose a few a few questions to you. Um, uh, in your proprietary software uh, workflows, do you have a deep understanding of what this software does? Is it future-proof? Will you be able to use this software? And will it still be in support 40 plus years from now? Will you be able to embed it in media uh, such that if you if someone you know some further civilization years and years from now finds this media and can somehow read it uh will it it be able to run will they be able to figure out what is going on in it um or even just like uh in the, in the near future how if someone tries to play this back or uh will they be able to and will they be able to in a way that is not encumbered by um you know, royalties and patents and things and other things that could be problematic. And how, how has anyone actually seen what your proprietary software does uh, enough to vouch for its quality and robustness? Um, I think all the all the crashes 
uh, I'm like I'm sure I'm not the only one that experiences tons of crashes and like Premiere all the time uh, can attest to. And the last thing I'd like to note here is that a lot of vendors, not not all of them, but a decent amount of them, especially in the digital media and broadcast uh, industry, really like to spread uh, FUD or fear, uncertainty, and doubt about open source software, despite being built on it. Um, which is disingenuous to say the least, but I guess they want to make money without actually having to implement the things that they're selling. So why should you care about open source though as a solution to the, these problems outlined before? Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose a situation to you. Have you ever had a problem for, this is uh, more on the openness in general, but have you ever had a problem with, you know, some kind of software where you were driving yourself nuts for days and days and days? Um, you're like, why is it giving my video a green tinge? I don't know. Um, support was pretty useless. They just kind of said, oh, you're using it wrong if you have support. Um, and then like a year or two years later, you're talking to someone at a conference and they go, oh, I had the exact same issue and I found uh, this fix, but there was nowhere to put this fix. Um, I think that that even that level of openness, not necessarily open source, but that level of openness is incredibly useful for collaboration and the health of the uh, media and archival ecosystems in general, because you can Google things that are on open bug trackers and mailing lists. And um, that is uh, extremely useful. Um, and to address the support bit, um, Obviously, it's not an SLA, it's not like a um, service level agreement, but many projects do offer paid support options. Uh, Video Labs offers that for VLC and FFmpeg work, etc. cetera. Um, media Area offers that for your FV1 needs, raw cooked, uh, media contact kind of thing. And uh, this is not an uncommon thing. A lot of open source projects have this option because like open source developers need to eat too. We like food on our tables. And lastly here, I'd like you to sit and think, do you even need a paid support contract? Um, do, like, is your usage sufficient to require one? Uh, is it just there to make management happy? Um, uh, a thought experiment is to weigh the cost of a single employee's salary who could work on this versus some expensive support contract. Um, is it worth it? Uh, maybe you can do it. Maybe community members will help because by and large, the open source community wants to just make good software and polite feature requests and bugs is sufficient in like a healthy project. Of course, none of this is to say that proprietary software like doesn't have its place and its value. It can be quite good at like handling weird niche things that nobody is going to want to work on in their free time uh, or that are just painful um, or, you know, government stuff. Okay, so you're, you're sold on open source, or maybe you're not sold, but you uh, are interested. Why should you contribute? Um, uh, I think it's a better use of people's time in general. Uh, getting to know the community of projects you use or uh, the documentation, the code around it will often save you time in the long run because you know this stuff now. There's, there's no reason that you need to... Um, you know, spend 10 hours reading the documentation every time you need to do something. But um, it, it's an investment payoff sort of thing. And um, by uh, interacting with the community, you, the, a lot of the developers are a lot more likely to actually help you uh, or fix things for you. Um, and uh, by and large, if you have internal forks, you may think, oh, it's easy, just a couple of patches on top. We can maintain it, it's pretty easy skip forward 10 years and 10 more projects and you've got a right mess. Um, and also it benefits uh, the ecosystem as a whole. Um, I should say your ecosystem. So in my case, it's, you know, digital media streaming and maybe archival for you, but um, having more standard implementations, less divergence and better interop benefits everybody. And it makes your jobs easier uh, when things just work because everybody's uh, contributed to something open. And um, uh, also, it's, uh, this may be a little uh, selfish, but it does gain you influence within a community. And if you're making heavy use of a tool, you may want to say on how that tool is developed and its roadmap going forward. And uh, of course, it also, you know, 
helps others, which is, you know, altruistic. Everybody's happy. And uh, by and large, the main reason, this is the main reason I do it, of course, uh, is fun. Uh, I enjoy it. And even if it didn't benefit like everybody, like it just benefited me, I would still do it because it's enjoyable. So you want to contribute. Um, don't think code is the only way you contribute to open source software. Uh, a lot of open source software is in desperate need of help with documentation, not just tech technical documentation, user guides, wiki articles, comments, and code, like everything. Like, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but code programmers aren't necessarily the best at writing useful and helpful documentation. Um, you help with bug tracker triage, replying on forums, user support in general. Um, most projects will have a separate IRC channel for that. And um, it's, I think it's a very underlooked uh, part of open source. And uh, lastly, and this is very probably very relevant to this room is please, please, please supply test files so we can reproduce bugs, test features, and, uh, and all that sort of stuff because a lot of these weird archival formats or uh, streaming formats are a little too, um, let's call them professional, to be accessible by uh, uh, you know random, random guy working on FFmpeg. Um, and if you do want to contribute to code, um, I... The, probably the best way is to find something you just want to do for fun in it, or if you have a pet issue, to try and fix it, try and submit it, ask, maybe ask for help along the way. Um, or if, if you're just like, you just you want to do something, but you don't know what, check the bug tracker, wiki, IRC Slack, they're all good starting points. Um, someone could probably point you towards uh, good small tasks, be they greenfield or bug fixes. So, uh, Great, you're ready to contribute, but before you do, um, I really want to stress to read any available rules. Um, like this includes, you know, code of conducts, mailing list rules, code style rules, how to submit patches, uh, any relevant documentation to what you're doing, be that wiki etiquette or developer uh, rules, or you know, worst case, if you're contributing to a corporate project, signing a CLA. Um, but uh, that. Nobody, nobody likes that guy who shows up and just ignores all, all the regular processes and, uh, and then gets angry when nobody wants their uh, patch. Um, this, in, this involves learning any required tools like mailing lists, Git, um, send email, format patch, GitHub pull request if, if that's how the project does it. Um, and make sure you communicate on the right channel, like the correct mailing list, so it's usually documented quite prominently on the developer documentation. Uh, there's usually a dev and a user mailing list or bearing that an IRC channel or Slack channel or uh, GitHub issues. Um, and please don't email developers directly or privately um, unless they've told you to do this because speaking from experience, this is really, really annoying. Um, but most of this is common sense and I, I, you probably wouldn't do that. Um, but you'd be surprised how many potential new contributors like don't know that they just kind of expect someone to be their to basically be their professor um, and t tell them exactly what to do step by step. Um, by and large, the open source community expects you to do your research before uh, starting. Uh, and uh, just a side note here: don't be that user who complains about everything wrong in a project about something that doesn't work, about how it's not better than some other proprietary thing, but then do absolutely nothing about it. That's really super annoying and demotivating. Um, but of course, and of course, these are just guidelines and every project is different. Um, so a little bit on interaction. Uh, again, this is mostly common sense. Uh, just be polite, genuine, and of course, technical if, if you're submitting code. Um, but when, when you write your, your emails or uh, changes or anything like that, uh, a well thought out and concise uh, explanation uh, really matters, like good prose matters for effectively communicating what you want to change and why, and it will dramatically lower the barriers to uh, people accepting what you uh, have submitted. And um, this includes like, don't, don't do things like, just kind of replying ping or plus one on a bazillion technical issues because that's just noise and people will probably get annoyed with that. And um, 
ask a lot of questions. Um, you know, not not to the level of annoyingness, but uh, by and large, people will want to help you if you are looking to contribute to a project they care about. Um, but don't just ask everything. Just like the last slide, check the documentation first if it's there. Um, people appreciate it if you do your due diligence before you uh, ask them to spend time helping them. And um, don't act, don't act entitled when you do that. Like you, you, your your feature that adds you know uh, fart decoder to FMPEG, it may not be everyone's top priority and. Maybe they don't want it at all, so don't act like they should accept your code because you've written it. Um, but also, um, th there are a lot of things you can do to minimize the barrier to adoption, like I mentioned before. Uh, in addition, to fully test all your code like as much as you possibly can, because again, it's a, if people don't have to spend a lot of time testing and doing due diligence for you, you'll be much more uh, likely to get your changes accepted. And as before, provide written rationale for your changes, like good good pros, and uh, provide any necessary context, background, and information on why you've made this change. Don't just think, submit a patch that says like, fix bug or make thing do X, because nobody's gonna know why. Like the why is the most important part of anything. And of course, be, be polite um, as before and uh, be open to critical feedback on your contributions, technical or otherwise, because in the end, everybody just wants the best possible code or documentation, et cetera, that we can get. Of course, even if you submit you know, the perfect patch, the perfect change, uh, you've done everything correctly, there's always gonna be that one guy who's gotta be a jerk to you. Um, and some of this advice to me seem kinda crappy, but Try not to take it personally, at least at first. Everybody is human. Everybody has bad days. Um, however, if it's consistently poor behavior, it's probably worth raising, raising to community at large. Uh, it helps if you're an established community member, but I, you don't necessarily need to be. Um, there's usually a proper channel for this, at least there hopefully is. Um, sadly, not every open source project has a code of conduct, or if they do, it may not be enforceable. Um, Maybe that's also worth mentioning, um, but also make sure you're not complaining technical criticism with someone being a jerk. Like you, your your patch is your baby, but you need to be open to technical criticism about it. Um, if there's one piece of advice I would give to dealing with like, a jerk is don't hit reply and then type out a big 10 page flame war b immediately because in the moment you're probably upset and you're probably gonna say stuff you regret so just don't sit on it, think for a little while, and then uh, send a polite, measured response, explain they've not acted acceptably, and respond to any kind of uh, legitimate points they have as well. Of course, uh, you don't have to contribute to an established project, you can make your own. And this is also a great idea. I mean, you don't want the jerks in your projects, you don't have to let the jerks in your projects. Um, uh, it, if, if, you're, if you think your thing that you want to do is too niche, it's nothing is too niche. A lot of proprietary software covers these niches and people pay a lot of money for them. So chances are your, your uh, niche project is super useful to everybody. And um, if there's internal tools at your work, it can, they can be super useful to other people. Uh, look at IFI scripts, it's like, and how it's taken off. Um, and of course, this this depends. What you want to make open source depends heavily on what your quote unquote secret sauce is. Um, for archivists, I'm not entirely sure what that would be. Someone should should probably inform me about what uh, would be acceptable and not acceptable to open source. And of course, maybe you just want to do it for fun. And uh, lastly, let's cover a good example, which I talked about yesterday, is FV1. It has an open specification, and multiple tested implementations. No licensing fees, NDAs, payable specifications, great for adoption. Uh, it has paid support available. If you want support, you can pay for it. And it has an open and polite mailing list, GitHub. Developers are nice, respectful. It has a code of conduct, and it has documentation on how to contribute. And uh, with that, uh, we'll wrap it up and move on to questions.
Um, I'm uh, very uh, interested of uh, uh, this, but uh, I, I see I heard only the pros of the open source and haven't heard the contrast of open source. I all the time mentioned that there is a two main uh, two main concept, two main uh, flavor of uh, open source. One is that made by community just to make open source, and another one is uh, uh, making. Uh, uh, open source by the people that uh, have some, uh, I don't know, standards or some idea or something, and they uh, do it in uh, open source. And my question is uh, why we haven't heard the uh, uh, contrast of the open source. One of the uh, biggest uh, of it is uh, open source mostly have no access to the standards because they are high prices. For this reason, they make uh, many things by reverse engineering. And as I all the time say, it's uh, uh, much harder, much difficult to make from sausage pig than from pig sausage. So this is the. You need to wrap up the question. Okay. Th th thank you. Um, just, just a second question for Derek. Um, just, I, I'd like to know what his experiences have been. Just maybe seeing an increased um, amount of archivists, maybe um, engaging with some of these projects like VLC, FFmpeg, or maybe even. Um, if he's heard of any um, ones coming to Vimeo looking for support and just just his um, feelings about that. That's Kieran O'Leary from the IFI, sorry. Um, okay, so me as Derek. Um, so I'm not sure that's true anymore about not being able to afford specs. That's kind of an old thing. Usually people who care about the things that need specs often contribute them nowadays or f uh, contribute funding for them. I wouldn't say there's much contrast like there was 10 years ago. The industry has adopted FOSS tools a lot. Are there any other questions? We have another minute or two. It's a slightly slow process, but yes, okay. Uh, so Carl. allow me to say something I said before yesterday. First, hi, Derek, this is Carlo again. Thank you for your great presentations. I always enjoy them very much. So uh, the same question was, uh, po was asked on Wednesday, and I will repeat my answer because I believe it's interesting for the community as well. There's, of course, nothing wrong with specifications. They were used for many implementation of open source software, and uh, they can be extremely helpful. But I think it should be noted that there are many specifications that contain bugs, and this is not unusual, and it is not surprising. After all, they were written by humans as well. So in the end, if you succeed in reverse engineering a format, you will always and definitely get a better result than implementing from a specification. This is at least what, what historic evidence within the FFmpeg project shows. Thank you. Uh, he responded, he's, he's not quite sure uh, if, if he understood what you, what you were getting at. Uh, um, and I guess there's too much delay for him to be able to respond effectively. So he said, uh, if, y if you want to get in touch with him, you know, um, you know, write him on Twitter, uh, you know, send him a DM. So thank you, Derek. So sorry about the difficulty. Um, yeah. <laughs>